All right, well, welcome to week four of our midweek Bible study. It's great to have you with us again. We are excited as we begin to make our way into the Ten Commandments, one of the major epochs of biblical and human history. So today we're going to be doing just kind of an introductory lesson about the Ten Commandments. And then for the weeks that follow, we'll do each one and look at what they mean for the people of Israel, but also what they mean for us today. So we are ready to go. We're in Exodus chapter 20, so I'd invite you to turn there. Uh, also, if you want to follow along, there are some notes in the description below the YouTube video. So here we go. Exodus chapter 20. We've got Charles Spurgeon here. You ready to go, Charles? Yes? Okay, he's ready. All right, Exodus chapter 20. We're just going to read the first two verses um, as we introduce the Ten Commandments this afternoon. Chapter 20, verse 1 says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. So as we become, <clears throat> as we come to these Ten Commandments, uh, what we have to understand is that these are really an important part, not just simply of biblical history, but of human history as well. Uh, these Ten Commandments have formed the foundation of Jewish and Christian ethics for <clears throat> thousands of years. They've also formed the uh, moral basis for most of Western society as we know it in terms of our understanding of right and wrong. Of course, we know that a lot of this is being eroded away, um, but these have certainly changed the world in a unique way. Um, but I hope we understand that these Ten Commandments are more than just simply a list of rules that God expects us to live by, um, but rather they are actually an expression, a written expression of the very attributes of God. We're going to look at that a little bit more uh, later and, of course, in detail as we go through each one. But each one of them reflects an aspect of his character, and so these are well worth our time in studying. But let's get familiar with these Ten Commandments. Um, now, first thing you'll notice is that God doesn't actually call them the Ten Commandments. Uh, we've named them that. Now, they certainly are Ten Commandments. They're not Ten Suggestions uh, or Ten Opinions. Uh, these are Ten Commands that God gives to the children of Israel. But of course, they have relevance for us today as well. Uh, the Jews referred to them as the Ten Words. So that's why in verse 1 of chapter 20, it says God spoke all these words. Uh, sometimes we give them the nickname or the name of the Decalogue. Deca meaning in Greek ten, logos, word. Uh, so the Ten Words of God. They are divided into two sections. Uh, commandment 1 to 4 have to do with our relationship to God. They are all about our vertical relationship. Commandments number six to 10 have to do with our relationship with our neighbor, with others. So that's the commandments of like, do not steal and do not murder and do not lie. How we treat others. Uh, <clears throat> apologies to all those who are a bit OCD. They're not broken up exactly uh, in one to five, but that's how they are. One to four with our relationship with God, six to 10, our relationship with our neighbor. Um, hence, when Jesus is asked in Matthew chapter 22 by the uh, lawyers, by the Pharisees, uh, what is the greatest commandment? It's interesting, Jesus doesn't go to Exodus chapter 20 and pick commandment number one, for example. He actually goes to Deuteronomy chapter 6, and he says that the greatest commandment is this, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he says the second is like unto it, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Because upon these two commandments do all the law and the prophets hang. Okay, so Jesus summarized the law like this, love God, love your neighbor. And so that really helps us to understand that these commandments really ought to be obeyed out of a motivation of love. Now, we don't often think of laws as being something that we love or that we do because we love the person who made those laws. So for example, we don't uh, obey our traffic laws because we just have this deep affection uh, for the Australian government and we love our country so much that we want to obey uh, these traffic laws. We normally obey these traffic laws purely out of fear of punishment uh, or uh, because we're afraid of getting a fine. 
But Jesus says that these commandments are to be done out of a motivation of love. That's what they are given to us. Now, you'll notice as we go through these Ten Commandments that there is something which is actually missing in these Ten Commandments. And that is there is not one single commandment which tells you to focus on yourself. God doesn't give us any commands to love ourselves, to serve ourselves, uh, to focus anything on ourselves. They are given to us to look outside of ourselves, firstly to God, and secondly, to our neighbor. Do you know why that God doesn't give us any commands about ourselves? Because we don't need a commandment to love ourselves. We love ourselves already too much. That's actually our main problem. Uh, so none of these are given to serve ourselves. They're given to love God and love our neighbor. Now, when we speak of the law, uh, sometimes we we get we use that term, we use that word uh, to describe a few different things. For example, the Jews referred to the first five books uh, of the Bible as the law of Moses. So sometimes the law can wor- refer to the whole uh, Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Sometimes the word law can refer to the whole law code. So the moral law of the Ten Commandments, the civil laws, which is how these Ten Commandments play out in everyday society. And then the ceremonial laws, which is all the sacrifices and offerings and things like that. So sometimes we use the word law to describe just that law code. And then other times, and you'll probably hear me do this when I say the law, I'm referring to simply these Ten Commandments, uh, the moral law of God. Um, So sometimes that word can get used uh, in different ways. But as I said, this these Ten Commandments are the foundation for the, the, the whole uh, law system which governed the children of Israel. And there's three different aspects to this whole system. There's the moral law, which is given to us here in the Ten Commandments. Uh, there's the civil law, which follows the moral law, and that's how these Ten Commandments play themselves out in civil society. That's all the commandments and the judgments of what to do in this situation and that. We'll go through those, not in incredible detail, but we will go through those. And then following the moral law and the civil law is the ceremonial law. That all has to do with the priestly role, the sacrifices and the offerings for sin, the peace offerings and the meal offerings and all the different things that were given uh, after the moral and civil law. And there is a significance to that, which we'll get into. But I want us to kind of, with that, understanding in mind that this is what we're looking at here and this is kind of the framework let's look at a few different aspects of the law and by that i mean just simply the moral law these 10 commandments so first of all i want you to notice the person of the law it says this this is moses he's ascended to the top of mount sinai i remember god has descended down to the top of this mountain and he is giving these uh, laws he's actually going to be writing them in stone Uh, for Moses to then take down to the people. It says, God spoke all of these words saying, I am the Lord your God, or I, the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. So the person of the law. We must understand that these commandments were not the product of man's desires. They weren't the product of man's imagination. They weren't the product of man's evolutionary development to the point where he thought, you know what, I could really use some moral standards to abide by here that would really help me (laughs) advance my intellect uh, or my standing in the world. No, no, these commands came directly from God. God spoke them. He said, I am the Lord your God, the self-existent one, the one who has existed for all eternity gives these moral commands. You see, all laws, regardless of whether they're civil laws or moral laws, they have to have a law giver. Laws don't just simply appear out of nowhere. They don't just simply come into existence. They don't spring into existence. They don't develop over time. They're not the product of uh, Darwinian evolution or anything. All laws, whether they are judicial laws or laws of principle, such as the law of gravity or the law of thermodynamics or all of these types of things, they come from a law giver. This is pretty self-evident, I think. 
the fact of the matter is, is that mankind, not only did they not come up with these Ten Commandments, even if they could have, they wouldn't. Why would you? Uh, why would you come up with a set of laws or rules that you yourself couldn't live by and couldn't abide by and actually condemned you because you knew that there's no possible way for you to obey fully these laws demands. Uh, this is exactly why our society has fallen into uh, this moral relativism and individualism where everybody does that which is right in their own eyes. That was the time of the judges, wasn't it? Later on, as Israel gets into the land, they forsook the law of God and everybody did that which, they ple which pleased them and that which they wanted to do themselves. Why? Because they didn't want to subject themselves to an objective moral law which condemned them, but rather lived by their own set of rules and their own desires. This is exactly where our society is and is headed more and more so. Um, now, all of these laws, the, the Ten Commandments, I have to understand that they are given by God, not because God just decided to come up with some rules that he wanted to hold mankind by um, just to be cruel or nasty or uh, restrictive or unloving, but each and every single one of them actually reflects a part of the attributes and character of God. And so to violate these laws is to violate the very nature of God himself. So for example, the first one says, you shall have no other gods before me. Why? Because God is self-existent. He is the only God. So to violate that, to worship another God, is to worship a, a God that doesn't exist. And so therefore, it's a violation of who God is. He says, you shall have no idols. Don't make any cray, uh, carved image or wooden image. Why? Because God is spirit. He is not made in the image of a figurine or anything or an icon. God is transcendent above all of these things, and he is spirit. Uh, he says, you won't take, do not take the Lord's uh, name in vain. Why? Because God is holy, <clears throat> and he is to be uh, revered <clears throat> above all things. That's who he is. He says, remember the Sabbath day. Why? Because God is a God who worked. God works, and he's orderly. Uh, he created the world in order, and so to abide by uh, 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 that order and those principles, he gives this command. He says, honor your father and your mother. Why does he do that? Because even within the Trinity, there is honor and submission. The Son submits to the Father. The Holy Spirit submits to the Son. There's a, an orderliness about the, even the, tr the Trinity there. God says, do not murder. Why? Because God is life, and he is the life giver. And so to take a life is to violate who God is. God says, do not commit adultery. Why? Because God is faithful. He says, thou shalt not lie. Why? Because God is truth. And do not covet. Do not desire something so much that you're willing to sin in order to get it. Why? Because God himself is sufficient. So you can see that these commands are not just simply rules that God decided to come up with because he had nothing else to do, but rather they are a reflection of his very character and nature, which is also why, and I'm kind of skipping ahead here, but it's also why the psalmist could say that I delight in your law. Why? Because to delight in God's law is actually to delight in the person of God himself. A person who loves God will love his law because it's a reflection of of who he is. So you cannot despise, or sorry, you cannot love God and despise his law. Now, that's the, the person of the law. What about the place of the law? And by that I mean what place does it fit in the biblical narrative, in the law code itself, and also in the immediate context of the story that's being set here in Exodus? Where does the law fit? Um, I think it's helpful to understand where it fits in each of these three sections. The, the entire biblical narrative, the, law, the whole law code, remember those three parts of the law code, and in this immediate context, because understanding where it fits helps us to understand the purpose of God's law. 
So first of all, in the entire biblical narrative, where do the Ten Commandments fit? Well, we obviously see that they come quite early on in the biblical narrative and in uh, biblical history. They certainly come before the cross. They precede Jesus. They they are, uh, in, in historical terms, they are, they are uh, prior to uh, Mount Calvary. Mount Sinai always precedes Mount Cal- Calvary. Why? Because the law reveals the righteousness of God. And at the same time, it reveals the unrighteousness of man. So the people, it's interesting, when, uh, when God gives them these Ten Commandments, and even before all of this, uh, when God speaks to the people through Moses in Exodus chapter 19, the people actually think that they have the ability to keep all the commands that God gives them to do. They cry out a few times, all that you have said to us, we will do. Well, we know that that didn't happen. Matter of fact, even, spoiler alert, but even a little bit further down the road, before even Moses comes back down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments in hand, they've already broken almost all of the Ten Commandments. They're worshiping a golden calf. They're running around being immoral. Uh, they are uh, living in sin even before the law comes to them. And so you see here that the law of God reveals the righteousness of God and the unrighteousness of man. And the reality is, just like in biblical history, you cannot get to Calvary, Mount Calvary, before or unless you have been broken, first of all, by Mount Sinai. So in our presentations of the gospel with people, this is why it is absolutely vital that they understand why Jesus had to die. He had to die because we are unrighteous in the eyes of God. Uh, We have broken all of his commands. We deserve and are justly deserving of his wrath and of his punishment, and, and we are guilty by nature and by choice. Hence, we needed a savior. You know, Jesus showed this, of course, remember, to the rich young ruler. Uh, he said to the ruler, and you know, the ruler comes to him and says, you know, I have kept all these commandments from my youth. I've, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I've obeyed my parents. I've loved, you know, I've, uh, um, I haven't stolen. I haven't lied. I've kept all the commandments as if that was actually true. But either way, and Jesus says to him, all right, go sell all that you have and come and follow me. And it revealed the nature of his heart, that he loved his money more than he loved God. Jesus also did this on the Sermon on the Mount, didn't he? When he explained to the Pharisees the nature of the law of God. You say you haven't committed adultery, but I say to you, if you look upon a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. In other words, no one can understand salvation unless you first understand condemnation. Unless you first see yourself here condemned by the law. So that's where it fits in the biblical narrative. It comes before the cross. Don't preach the cross unless you've preached the law. Second of all, um, where does it fit in the entire law code? So we have the moral, civil, ceremonial law. It becomes, it's the first one. It's the first one that God gives. And then he follows on that with the civil law and then the ceremonial. Why? This teaches us that any society uh, basically sets its views of civil society upon its understanding of morality. If you don't view human life as sacred and as significant and as special, you will then set your laws to fit your view of morality. We have seen this in history. We are seeing this even happening today with the whole abortion argument. If you don't view human life and don't understand human life as a sacred thing, then your laws will reflect that. If you don't see honesty as something which comes from God, your laws will reflect that and so on and so forth. So the moral law sets the foundation for the civil law. However, this also helps us to see that God gave the moral, then the civil, but then he gives the ceremonial. Why? Because we know that no one can keep the moral law perfectly, 
We know that even in civil matters, because we are sinners by nature and by choice, we will fail to love God and love our neighbor. And so what is needed after that is a, an offering, a sacrifice. Hence the need for the ceremonial laws, the sacrifices for our sin. Now again, all of these point to the ultimate sacrifice. The one who would rescue us and redeem us for the uh, sins that we have committed against God and against our neighbor. The Lord Jesus Christ. So this teaches us, of course, that the ceremonial law comes after the moral and the civil law. Because we cannot keep these laws in and of ourselves. But then there's also the immediate context here. <clears throat> so where does the law fit in this whole story of the Exodus and so on and so forth? Well, he says here in verse 2, he says, I, the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the household of bondage. Okay, so the law comes after redemption for the children of Israel. It doesn't come before it. Um, God redeemed them by the power of his own hand. Then he gives them these laws to abide by. God did not give the Ten Commandments to, to them in Egypt and say, okay, here's my rules. And if you obey these rules perfectly, then you can come out of Egypt. I'll be back in five years and see how you go. That's not the way it happened. The law never redeems. It cannot redeem. It has no power to redeem. But after their redemption, God gives them the law to keep. And through the keeping of his commandments, there was blessing, there was prosperity, uh, and there was delight as the nation was blessed by God and a light to the world. So this teaches us, again, that the law of God does not disappear after salvation. Jesus himself said, I did not come to destroy the law, but I came to fulfill it. I came to be the fulfillment of God's righteousness and to demonstrate what that looks like. You see, the righteousness of the law is only fulfilled in Christ. And for those who are redeemed, whose hearts have been redeemed, we delight in his law and his love after we are redeemed. Prior to our salvation, we didn't love the law of God. We despised the law of God because it condemned us. But after our hearts are regenerated, we have a love and affection for the love, for the law of God. I right, should turn with me to Romans chapter 8. And uh, there's a lovely passage here. And of course, if you know the book of Romans, the way it's set out, uh, Romans 1 through 5 talk about our justification, or our need for justification. Romans 6 through 8 talk about our sanctification. If we look at Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 4, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law or the principle of sin and death. For what the law, that's the, the Old Testament law, could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So what does that bring us to? So the place of the law, where does it fit in the entire biblical narrative? Of course, precedes the cross. In the law, law code, it points us and brings us to the ceremonial law, our need for a sacrifice for a savior. And then, of course, in the immediate context, it follows the love of God's law, follows uh, our redemption, our salvation. So that brings us to the purpose of the law. What is the, what are the, what is the purpose of the Ten Commandments? So if you think about it, if we are commanded to, by God to keep the law, but God knows that we can't, what then is it is its purpose? Is God just playing tricks on us? Is he giving us a standard that's unable to achieve, uh, and therefore subjecting us all to his condemnation and we have no hope whatsoever? What's the purpose of the law? Well, as we saw, based upon where it fits in uh, biblical history and also in the law code itself, the first purpose of the law is that it is diagnostic in nature. So the law in itself, the Ten Commandments, have no redemptive power. They have no ability to save. The only thing that the Ten Commandments can do for us, apart from giving us uh, God's standards uh, of, I guess, a civil society to abide by, is 
they simply diagnose the problem. And this is really the purpose of, of any law. It, it holds us to the standard, it holds the standards anyway, sorry, to which people are held by and condemned by. You know, for example, if you enjoy stealing, if that's something you enjoy doing, there are no amount of laws that a country or a society can impose upon you which can take away that love of stealing. No, it can change your heart. It can't change that desire to steal. It can merely punish you when you're caught. You know, the book of James talks about the law of liberty, the law of God, <coughs> excuse me, acting like a mirror. What does a mirror do? A mirror just simply re reveals or reflects uh, the problems or the errors that we have in our face or our hair or whatever it is. Uh, that's what the law of God does. It reveals the sinfulness of our own lives. And just like you don't, if you find dirt on your face when you look in a mirror, you don't rub your face on the mirror, uh, you don't also go to the law of God for any redemptive qualities. It doesn't provide any of that, nor was it intended to. That's why it preceded the ceremonial law. It pointed them to their need for a sacrifice. This is what Romans chapter 7, verse 8 says. He says, But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire, for apart from the law, sin was dead. Uh, earlier in, in verse 7, uh, the Apostle Paul says, um, uh, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. So the law reveals the sinfulness of man. It's diagnostic in nature. Not only that, but the law is didactic in nature. What do I mean by that? It means that it teaches us. It's instructive. It instructs us in righteousness. You know, Psalm uh, 19, uh, one of our most famous Psalms, Psalm 19 says this, that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. So the law teaches and instructs us in righteousness. You know, when Jesus taught <clears throat> the Sermon on the Mount, uh, he essentially was explaining and expounding the heart and the nature of the law. And he taught them according to the law of God. He didn't substitute the law of God with his new set of standards or ethics. He merely dove into them and explained them uh, in a deeper way, which the Pharisees, of course, had no idea about. So the law is diagnostic, it's didactic, it's uh, didactic, it teaches us. The law is also directive in nature. And by that I mean is that the Ten Commandments are meant to direct us to Christ. This is why, again, they preceded the ceremonial law. And this is why they preceded uh, the cross. Because they point us to the one who can fulfill and has fulfilled them and also the one who provides the full atonement and salvation from our sin. Uh, the law simply directs us to our need for a Savior. Because who in their right mind could actually put their hand up and say, yes, I have perfectly fulfilled all that the law requires. I have loved God with all of my heart, mind, and strength. And I have loved my neighbor for all of my life perfectly. None of us can say that. Galatians says that the law is our schoolmaster, bringing us to Christ. You cannot, you cannot be saved. You cannot be saved unless you have first seen your own peril and your own doom under the condemnation of the law. And then you look to Christ. You don't look to the law. You look to Christ as your only hope. And then lastly, the law is delightful in nature. And this is a a strange concept for us, because as I said before, who who actually wakes up and delights in the laws of our land? They restrict our freedom. Uh, they bring punishment upon us when we break them. Nobody wakes up and says, oh, I just really delight in all the laws uh, that, uh, that I have in my country. But yet the law of God is meant to be a delight. You see, upon conversion, upon salvation, and uh, coming to Christ and, uh, and being born again, given a new nature, 
all of a sudden now on the inside, because we our hearts are transformed rather to love sin but to love God, we then are changed to love the very law that used to condemn us. Romans 7, 22, Paul says, For I delight in the law of God, according to the inner, inward man. I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man. Again, Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 1 to 4 says, There's no condemnation uh, for those who walk according uh, to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Uh, verse 4 so says the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk according to the Spirit of God. How strange is it that we could be like the psalmist and like the Apostle Paul to say, I actually delight in the law of the Lord. And this is my prayer over the next couple of weeks as we study the Ten Commandments, that they will continue to point us to Christ, the only one who has ever fulfilled by letter and by spirit, every single one of these commandments. And that it would also draw us closer to Jesus. In the Old Testament, the law pushed people away. It condemned and, uh, and it, and it uh, condemned them to death. We can delight in the law of God after the inner man if that inward man has been made alive by the Spirit of God. Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. We look for righteousness as the law of God is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. So the Ten Commandments are both the sinner's doom, but they are also the saint's delight. The psalmist said again in Psalm 19, he says that of these commandments, of the law of the Lord, of the statutes and testimonies and commandments and judgments of the Lord, he says, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. So, as we study these Ten Commandments, we don't go to them for our salvation. Uh, we don't go to them for our hope, for our um, even for any power over sin. We come to them because they reveal the righteousness of God. We love God because we love, uh, we, we love God uh, as, we, as we love his law, but also they point us again to Christ, again and again and again. That's what they do. They bring us back to the person of Jesus Christ. So my prayer is, as we look at all of these, that you will be drawn closer to Christ as we see our own sinfulness, but of course, the glory of his righteousness. And so I hope that you'll enjoy those over the next couple of weeks. I think Charles will too. Yep, he said yes. <laughs>